Welcome everyone. It's really wonderful to see so many people on this call and I have the pleasure of giving a brief introduction to our speaker today, Julia Forsyth. Julia has been at Brock University's Centre for Pedagogical Innovation since 2005. She started there as a special projects facilitator and she is now the Director of Teaching and Learning where she does an amazing job. I am a, a, a witness to that as I've had many, many lovely interactions with Julia. She continues to support the goals of education to transform lives through high quality teaching, learning, research, and a commitment to equity, justice, and accessibility situated within our community. She has been an ongoing and continuous champion for open education and is committed to honoring different ways of knowing and demonstrating knowledge. And I, I want to say again how really delighted I am to have Julia join us. I know how extremely busy she is, and I also know personally what an um, amazingly generous person she's always been with her time through, as we all know, very interesting and challenging circumstances sometimes. So uh, I'm really glad you're with us, Julia, and looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Ingrid. I'm really honored to be here. Um, I, I'm glad this is being recorded because I was a beneficiary of all the other recordings and I really appreciated learning so much from, so sometimes I wasn't able to come at noon and so I know a lot of people had message and say they'd, they'd like to watch the recording. So um, just to be amongst all the people who have spoken so far and who will yet um, speak, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to talk to you today. Um, I do want to start with a bit of a land acknowledgement. I'm on the St. Catharines campus here, um, which is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples, uh, many of whom continue to work and live here today. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the land protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement, which is the, the wampum belt that you see at the top there, which is the bone spoon. I've been pointing out recently about this wampum belt because I feel it's really relevant in our time because in our own land acknowledgement we talk about how it reminds us of our great standard of living um, of these shared resources which are you know I'm very grateful to live in the Niagara region which have so many amazing resources but this agreement um, has gone through time and more immemorial and has been you know reified in this this belt but it does remind us that the bowl or the resources and the spoon is something that we use not just um, to take and take our share, but also to serve. And so I'm I'm really grateful to, to, to ground my thinking in that. And then the other wampum belt is the two row, which I think we work in um, in partnership with our um, Indigenous colleagues. It was so great on Friday to see how many people um, showed up to the powwow um, uh, which is what our um, newly appointed elder, Cindy, um, has um, has always said is that if you want to help move reconciliation to action, um, you know, show up to these things. Um, and so I'm just going to do a little pitch for all the things that are coming up. We have a couple really interesting weeks, so I know this, um, <laughs> you know, you give me a voice and I'm going to I'm going to use it for a little bit of uh, promotion. So we have this uh, talk that's this week. Um, Mr. Sinclair is coming to, to Brock. He'll be at the Goodman uh, Atrium, and you can click on that link and register to go to that. It's going to be 4.30 to 6.30, just a renowned scholar. Um, the Decolonial Reading Circle, which we've been doing now for um, over three years, four years, five, what is time? <laughs> for a very long time, um, they're going to be reading, uh, um, discussing the reading of Bad Cree. And um, then we're having some Indigenous law, um, a book launch, uh, it's Tricky Grounds uh, is coming and there's a, a place where you can register there. And then finally, but definitely not um, least, is uh, CPI is really proud to sponsor this Perspectives on Indigenous Pedagogy um, with Dr. Sheila Cote Meek, who we're so grateful to be joining us here at Brock University um, with her co-editor. So this is gonna be the first one. She's gonna talk about the book as a whole, but there'll be a series of chapters. So thank you for giving the opportunity to, <laughs> to promote all those things. I think we have some really amazing things happening at Brock. Um, and so I just wanted to start with a little bit of a, um, when Jeannie reached out and she said, oh, do you want to do this? And I went, oh, I don't really want to talk about me as a leader. Um, 
Um, and so I, I thought I'd start with a little story. Um, although in high school, I did a lot of very leadership-like activities. I was a lifeguard. I taught swimming lessons. I taught, um, I was a fitness instructor. Um, I was on student council for two years. Um, as part of being on student council, they sent us away to leadership camp, which I was really grateful to do because I'd never been able to go to a way camp before. And it was super fun, the creative problem solving um, and just um, the activities, the, you know, just really collaborating to, to work on um, projects. Um, but when we came back, the vice principal pulled me aside and did a debrief on my leadership qualities. And he said, you know, we tended to notice that you didn't, you know, take the lead. <laughs> a lot, which I thought was funny because you send a whole bunch of really motivated, uh, keen, you know, like the keenest people in all of the Niagara region to off to camp and everybody wants to take the lead. And so when you're around a lot of really smart people, it's like actually maybe sometimes it's, um, you know, it's consolidating and thinking about what the best um, way forward and is it supporting great leaders. And so, you know, it's kind of stuck with me as like, well, maybe I'm not a leader, maybe I'm a supporter of good leaders. Um, but let's, <laughs> we'll, we'll unpack that as we go. Um, I wanted to do a little bit of a backstory. I am really grateful. Um, I don't usually talk a lot about this, so people know a little bit about um, my my story, but um, so many of the other people have shared their leadership stories have really been so courageous in sharing. And so I, I want you to see up in the top left corner is, is me with my baby. Um, it just makes me a little bit <laughs> vaclent to think about it. Um, she had um, she had open heart surgery when she was six months and it was at that time in in the year 2000, uh, maternity leave was only six months. And so she had surgery right when I had to uh, go back from maternity leave. I was a graphic designer at the time. And so I had to, I actually, in order to survive, I had to go on social assistance. And so um, navigating the social structures um, of like, I had done it in Toronto and then I came to Niagara was really challenging. So, um, and that was the time that I was like, oh my gosh, this like I'm a fairly intelligent person and this is difficult. <laughs> and so I was really motivated to kind of, I was like, we're gonna fix this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to university, I'm gonna figure it out. I was also really um fascinated with learning, um, watching uh, those of you who are parents or spend any time around children, like they're just like this amazing sponges. So I decided to come back to university. I'd already done my first year way back the 90s. Um, and I came back um, in 2001 and I was able to get Hannah into the daycare here on campus. And so all of that was really heavily subsidized by the social nets. And so if I didn't have social services, OSAP, um, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, the daycare um, subsidy, this ne it never would have been possible. Um, and so I was navigating a lot of really complex systems. And then in 2004, that's us, she graduated from daycare and I graduated from <laughs> university. Um, and then she asked me, can you not do school for a while? <laughs> and so um, I had, in 2001, I'd also um, started working actually in the Center for Teaching and Learning Educational Technology. They had posted uh, for a position to do um, a, um, a junior, a media developer kind of thing. And I was really heavily online right since the 90s. And so I had been making these little learning objects for Hannah actually about like Alphabet. And, and so I had a lot of experience using a, a very ancient tool now called Mac, Macromedia Flash. Um, and so that summer through the Experience Works program, which was also designed for students who um, were, uh, you know, fi in financial need to give them an opportunity to get experience working. Um, I was, you know, I was able to work all the way through from 2001 to 2004 and then in 2005 I became full-time as a special projects facilitator and my goal was really to I started thinking about um, what it meant to um, support students in flexible ways as somebody who was a mature learner coming back um, and I really wanted to do that like so I, a lot of the work I did was for online learning way back in 2005 um, but learning also like um, you know making uh, learning more meaningful and then in 2017, Hannah was going off to university and she, so we decided to go back to university together. And so this is kind of my journey of going, of, of what, um, 
I finally went and did my master's in 2017. Uh, thanks to much prompting. Um, I don't know if Camille is here, but Camille Rutherford was a real uh, champion on, and promoting that. So a lot of the people in the faculty of ed have been wonderful. And my advisor was uh, Dr. Raul Komar, and I'm very grateful for him for that. And so what I wanted to do um, and what I did look at was uh, this community, this uh, network participatory scholarship community called Fem Ed Tech. Um, and and I'll, I just want to take some of the leadership lessons that I took out of it. I was looking more about how policy can be created, but um, there's a lot of leadership that can be derived from that. Um, so early in my um, and my time working with faculty, even as a multimedia developer, I had come across the sustainable development goals. Dr. Tony Ward and Dr. John Middleton uh, were really working um, on those and I was helping them create either resources and projects for their for their classes. And I felt like this is th this is where the work is. Education can do this. And so instead of me going and fixing the social services, I was like education is is the most important one. And most importantly, is actually open education as somebody who really did have to forego um, paying rent and um, <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, groceries in order to buy textbooks. Like I really felt um, the importance of, I was like, I don't understand why the physics textbook keeps changing each year. It's like exactly the same. And I would look at the versions and it would be like horrifying to me. Um, but that I would pay like $120 for a textbook. So open education became um, one of the, the key things like open educational resources that I wanted to support. Um, but then as time go, went by, I started thinking more about how, um, um, oh, we um, open educational practices could be um, in place. And so I was thinking how wh what I didn't really understand um, at early was why wasn't everybody <laughs> Why doesn't everybody care about this? <laughs> Why doesn't everybody want to make it more accessible for students? Why aren't we all trying to work to, to make the world a better place? I know that so many, I worked with so many people who cared deeply and I knew that the faculty here really do care, but I, but it seemed to be a, a really difficult, um, I, I just couldn't quite get at the core of what it was. And so, you know, the typical faculty workload, if you're a tenure track faculty is like, 40% research, 40% teaching, and 20% ser uh, service. And I was like, look at all the different ways that you can be open. Why? Are, let's let's do that. <laughs> um, and it made me. It does bring us back to this. Um, the notion of like back in 1990, Boyer talked about uh, scholarship reconsidered and how how you know really most people I work with they're. It, they're not in those distinct categories of teaching and research and service. They're they're overlapping. It's a Venn diagram, and so, uh, you know, I was I was like, yeah, this is the way we need to think about it, and also ways that we can allow multiple ways of knowing. And I really felt that was also a key part of open pedagogy was uh, respecting these other ways of knowing. And so um, I came across this resource um, by Eve uh, referencing Bordeaux. Um, so it's not just like the job. So at the top, you see material capital. It's not just the job that you get paid for. Like, obviously, you want your material needs met and it's important. But social and cultural capital, which they come together as symbolic capital, are so important. The way that your peers see you, the way that you are respected and what what um, other people value and think is important. And so um, they call this the, the prestige economy. Um, and so academic work and the prestige economy, like this crossover, is this disciplinary community, which is beyond, um, you know, working in your own department. Obviously, the work that you do within your de academic department at the university is important, but also globally, you have this larger network of people that, um, you know, you're on editorial boards, you go to conferences, and that, that allows you to, to, to speak and talk to all those other people. And so I was thinking how what does that look like and you know enter the internet um and network participatory scholarship which is public engagement through collaboration through network practices now typically this is talked on twitter uh this was done over twitter i joined twitter in 2009 um and it it changed my life because i met so many fascinating amazing interesting people um, and Stuart talks about um, a subset of Twitter called, uh, like Bon Stewart, it's her birthday today, um, talks about um, academic Twitter. 
And so I was watching all the various um, academic Twitter communities. Um, and I, I will get to this a little bit later, but obviously Twitter's not a place we can go to anymore. So rest in peace, Twitter. It's X now, but um, and it, it's, yeah. So, um, but it was a really good model and visualization to think about um, the way that disciplinary communities interact. And so one community that I was really particularly interested in was called Fem Ed Tech. So it's feminism, um, education, and technology. Sometimes people call it education um, educational technology, and it depends on where you're situated and whether you, you think those are separate or together. Um, and they, discuss, they describe themselves as a reflexive, reflexive emergent network of people learning and practicing and researching in educational technology. Um, and so I, I wanted to analyze their tweets over a span. It was only four months um, that I looked at it. it was um, it, The kickoff was at um, OER, um, 19, so it's a conference uh, run by Alt-C in the UK, typically, um, which I think Rajiv is keynoting the 2024 20, one, but anyway, the side, side stories. Um, and I, I just want to note that when I typed in FemEd Tech and this description that the AI for uh, PowerPoint came up with that picture, which I do think is better than my pictures that I did. So it's a really interesting thing. It does look a lot like the um, Tags Explorer that I use to analyze uh, the community. And this was the connections between everybody and what they um, what how they were communicating, what they were saying to each other. And there were over 800 um, unique tweets people would retweet and I used the retweet as sort of resonance to think about what how what was really important um, within the community um, and so I ended up doing uh, publishing with um, a lot of the amazing women who were involved in this project um, and this was kind of a summary but if you start at the beginning with that little red spiral uh, it's the gener genesis of shared curation and then keep following the spiral out um, in action and it was the values um, that um, really kind of guided the direction of FemEd Tech um, and, and the notion of being multiple. And so while we're, we're side by side, we're also very different. We can uh, recognize that uh, difference. So a lot of the work was doing an amplifying um, and, you know, also uh, dormancy is power where you don't always have to be active. Um, and so celebrating, creating spaces. Um, and then that led to, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later, is the, the quilt of justice and care. Um, but first I want to define feminism, I'm not talking about first wave feminism where the white women were allowed to vote or second wave feminism where wh women, white women were allowed to go into the workplace or even third uh, wave feminism um, where at least we were considering um, uh, black and brown and indigenous people um, it um, and and actually amplifying and uh, listening um, a lot of times we talk about giving voice but people already have voices and it's really just the listening part which is so important um, and so I think I first encountered it and I've come across it many other places but Sarah Ahmed quotes um, I'm going to forget who she quotes oh yeah Flavia uh, Dezo Dozen and she says, my feminism will be intersectional or it'll be bullshit. Um, and so it's it's about power and it's about who has it and who doesn't. And so as somebody, I guess, um, in our center and CPI, we've been talking a lot about, um, you know, positioning yourself and your positionality. And so, you know, many of you have probably seen the power wheel or the flower power. <laughs> Kosar's like, oh, yes, I've seen the flower power. Um, and so as somebody who came, like, I'm going to recognize, um, you know, when I was in my undergrad, like there was there was two, um, two or three areas where I did not hold, have power, maybe social class and family and education, but actually I hold so much privilege and I am and like recognizing that I remember at we did have a white privilege conference, um, a couple of them and Mary Beth Radden. Um, had talked about um, just like appearances and how her supervisor was like, oh, you look like my daughter. And just how um, how easy it has been for me to transcend. I don't, I, you know, I can put on a mask and pretend that I have power in all of those things and, and walk the walk and, and not everybody has that privilege. And so I think this is such an important 
um, piece to not only recognize my own privilege as a leader, but also um, recognizing that not everybody has that privilege and how we can, um, you know, work through the systems, which is where this um, the matrix of domination um, is really important. And so this is from data. A lot of my stuff came from um, data feminism. And so um, this is Catherine Dignazio, who is referencing Patricia Hill Collins and Black Feminist Thought um, and talking about how where power exists in these four domains. And so, you know, the flower power is my own personal power, but there's also a disciplinary domain, there's hegemonic domain and there's structural domain. And so these are levels that as leaders we need to be looking at and aware of when we are um, trying to... <laughs> Um, create this better world that I want to do all these, um, um, the sustainable development goals. And so it's really important to think about that. So um, I thematized the tweets into my own, what perhaps uh, a word cloud of a Julia Doodle. And a lot of these, um, these are the, the, the big areas of that, that came through. Um, and this is all being stitched together because there was a lot of really cool stuff around craft as activism and how women have been so involved in programming, you know, like like looms are a form of programming and so early programming. And so um, and, and a lot about reclaiming history. So women have been involved um, and, and, and black women. I mean, they made a movie about it, uh, um, you know, with the, the NASA, like how many people have actually made huge impacts and it's not part of the stories that we tell. Um, and there's been some really great work and what we're going to continue to do work with about Wikipedia and making sure that there's proper representation on like our knowledge bases so that we are adding and contributing to those. Um, and related to the craft activism, um, the, um, yeah, and, and uh, Kristen's talking about stitching the work together. And so here's another example of the assemblages. Um, so we wrote about this recently in this new amazing book that has 27 chapters that are so incredible. It's called Higher Education for Good. Um, and and these, these, each, each little square there has a story about um, you know, ab ab about what it means to be part of fem ed tech and what it means to be in the open. Um, and it, it had contributors from all over the world mail their little um, sewing patches in and Frances Bell um, sewed them all together and she was going to present it at OER 20, uh, except the pandemic happened and it became an online resource. Um, and so this was my contribution. It was a um, it was in honor of Audrey Waters, who always talks about the the pigeon, um, but also talking about Ursula Ligon, who um, was referenced by Donna Haraway um, in her story about um, the, the, the carrier bag theory of fiction, which talks about the importance of stories and the stories we tell. And so many of our stories are are like kind of like they're the ones that we learn in history about wars and male dominated. We, you know, we look at archaeology and there's like a spearhead and um, but but she says, well, what about what about the person carrying the baby who also carried the seeds home? Most people were probably carrying things. And what if our, our carrier carried the stories? And so that's why my carrier pigeon um, has a little backpack and with with some stories in there. Um, and repeatedly throughout this, like the quilt, the crafting motif um, comes together. Um, but what this community did often, because it was a shared curation. Um, so you're on Twitter, you would take a turn um, amplifying um, voices and um, and it was it was like a distributed method. Um, was they would revisit and do these values. Um, activities and make sure that everybody was on the same page that we our values were in alignment and they used that to form their code of conduct and it was an iterative process um, and so I thought about thinking about like the code of conduct the way that we think about policy like what if we had this iterative process of checking in what are our values um, how does that affect our policy um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that but I was able to do a cartography of FEMED tech I linked to my um, MRP which I put up into a scalar um, but basically this is a map of how values were sort of flowing through and I'll just take you um, briefly through um, the map um, so yeah the values are kind of like our guiding direction that led towards you know like a movement of people 
and, and governance towards a court of code of conduct, which I also was thinking in terms of could be the way we do collaborative policy creation. Um, access was a huge point um, that came up over and over again. Um, and so I was thinking about, you know, you know, the ship, making sure the ship can get to shore. But then I thought about who gets to be on the ship and how do we let people get on the ship? And are we allowing people with lived experiences also get to shore um, and be part of it? Um, and over moving over to the forest here, um, a lot of times we talk about economy um, in, in our discourse, um, but there's so much invisible labor that's done. Um, and I'm not saying that um, I know people have tried to make a lot of the, the domestic labor that happens um, like more, you know, to, you know, you think about how it gets outsourced um, often to women um, who you hire, but it, but it's so valuable and it, and it can never be overlooked in, in the, the work that we do. Um, when uh, I was watching the data feminism and also obviously all through the pandemic, there were so many people with their babies and arms. Um, that there's people in this room, you know who you are, um, who would who would be, you know, working with a baby and and just trying. And I, I mean, I identified with that as somebody who was doing my um, undergrad, but also like no choices. Like, you know, the babies were home and there was so much labor that was done. So uh, that was a, a resonant thing that I um, I also contributed to the higher education uh, for good uh, idea. I did this screen print thinking about, you know, again, um, the stories that we tell and how important um, child care is, um, even when we're trying when we're trying to do work, um, child care is work. And so there's so many things that um, uh, so many people who had to juggle so much during that time. It was uh, really challenging. Um, and then none of this comes uh, without considering embodiment. Um, and so you can maybe see I am, especially with educational technology, um, especially on places uh, on social networks, um, it's riskier and more dangerous for some people. And so you have to be respectful of um, and, and really consider consider what it means to be working either in the open or generally sharing and how it's riskier for some people. And, and as a leader, you want to make sure you can create those safe spaces or at least respect why people can't engage in certain spaces. Um, but then thinking about educational technology at the university, um, I've drawn the eye of Sauron there because surveillance capitalism is, is alive and well with all the ed tech vendors trying to, um, you know, infiltrate um, our education system. And we, I really do want us to think about uh, data privacy and, and consent of, of uh, students when we are using our educational technology tools. In particular, there's a picture there of somebody getting their eyes scanned, which is one of the things that I was really grateful that Brock took a stand during the pandemic to not have online proctoring because we know um, that certain bodies are um, at greater risk of getting caught because they are either neurodivergent or their skin color doesn't pick up on the, you know, because of the, the camera, the AI is biased. And so it was, it's a really important consideration when you think about policy creation, that, that there are bodies involved in, in the policy. It's not just, it's not detached from reality. Um, and so the principles of data feminism actually are kind of my principles of le leadership. We should examine power. We should challenge power. We should rethink binaries and hierarchies. And maybe this is where the binary part about leader and follower, when I got that feedback in high school, <laughs> I was like, I was like, oh, okay. So maybe there's a different kind of, um, of, pa of leader that doesn't have to be always at the front charging forward. It can actually be somebody who's, you know, in the back and, and consensus building. And again, uh, Rebecca Raby and um, uh, Shauna Chen talked a lot about this as well. And so I, I know we have really great leaders who think this way as well. And so I really appreciate them and learning from them. Um, again, elevating emotion embodiment, like in a learning situation, like we're whole people, there's there's more to us than just our, you know, <laughs> disembodied heads, although I guess I feel like that right now. Um, embracing pluralism, considering context and making labor visible are all the kinds of things that I 
uh, really value in leadership. It's an ongoing um, challenge. I'm not saying I'm succeeding all the time, but these are the things that I aspire towards and they are the same principles as that of feminism. So uh, I had done this early when I was thinking about um, hierarchies and, and networks. I was like, yeah, they're tired hierarchies and uh, and and uh, networks are, are wired and then somebody has to come up with the um, inspired level and I know that like when as a staff person when you log into work day you're obviously part of a hierarchy but really like so many of the uh, faculty like it's it's a little bit of a flat hierarchy so what can how can we uh, think about um, the way that we support well, as a staffers and how can I support faculty and then if you are a faculty how can you think about how you can be a leader within that kind of framework and so um, you know these disciplinary networks and your scholarly goals as long as there's a value alignment I think that can be really important um, and so I did say a little bit about how Twitter is I don't like I poor Jeannie was like I I don't, should I direct people to Twitter? And I was like, no, absolutely not. I'm just telling you what I I learned um, from this amazing participatory community. Somebody, yeah, Kristen, Mrs. Academic um, Twitter, and I do too so much. Um, and there are spaces that it's happening again. Uh, bless Anne Gagne, who keeps, um, who keeps <laughs> posting in different places and I really appreciate the people who continue to do it. I haven't found my space yet, but there are. Oh, yeah, maybe I should just go back to my space. No, just OK. Um, you know, there's Mastodon and there's Blue Sky, apparently, and there's LinkedIn. And um, I haven't found my place where it exists, but I know that those those people exist and those networks still exist. So I still feel like the um, the takeaways are as important. Threads. Yes. <laughs> um, um, Kathleen Fitzpatrick um, talks about um, uh, public good, and so the Humanities Commons is a place. I have jo I joined it ages ago, but I haven't really been very active. But I do think there's potential there. Um, you know, talking about um, other networks and where you can uh, work and share. Um, I've done some great and amazing work with Leslie Chan in uh, the Knowledge Equity Lab. It's based out of um, University of Toronto Scarborough. And I, I love the way that they are working on epistemic justice and talking about, um, you know, so that's it's kind of a network. They have a podcast and there, there's things together. It's a little bit different, but they definitely um, their values definitely align with me. So whenever they ask me if I want to do something, I'm like, absolutely. Um, and so then in closing, I just wanted to kind of do a check in with you like um, often when when things happen, I'm, and I'm like, what what are we doing here? Do we all know why we're here? Um, you know, what what do you think the purpose of a university is and what actions do we take every day to ensure that our work aligns with our values? And so like it's it's not um, it's sort of a reflection takeaway question, but I did want to point out two really important things. We have our academic plan. So many of the action items in there really do align with my values. And if we could really accomplish those, that would be great. So I'm going to encourage you to continue to read the academic plan. And currently there are strategic plan consultations. I I was on the board of trustees. I do know how sometimes they feel these things can feel um, like they are um, you know they go into the void but i think it's a really important activity that if you can find the time to go and, and give your feedback about what the ways that you think the direction that the university um should go then i i really encourage you to go to them and then that is i was going to give you some um additional readings um i was going to show you just some bonus drawings because i love the lasagna of care so much we layered it <laughs> <laughs> and um, um, talking about, um, you know, um, reconciliation is uh, something that Jackie Ottman had first said when I went to the University of Saskatchewan. So I wanted to add two little drawings that I was like um, just circling back to the beginning when I talked about, um, you know, the ways that we can show up and put our, our work into action. And that's everything. So thank you for your time and listening. Oh, thank you. That was uh, that was really incredible. Uh, I just want to say, Julia, I've spent um, 
a lot of time with you and I know we've had dinner together and, and talked about a, a lot of these things and it's always inspiring to uh, engage with you and, and I haven't heard about your background. I just want to thank you for sharing some of that. Um, it's uh, it really is courageous and when I see you talking about that and, and where, where you continue to go, I, I can see that connection. So I want to say thank you. And I know there's a lot of people on the call who may have comments.